Well, good evening. Kind of you to come in this rather terrible Melbourne weather, but I must say coming from Tasmania, it wasn't any better there either. So, um, I would like to talk about one particular case which I think is interesting, but which perhaps can be better understood if I give you uh, an introduction. Um, Ian Stevenson had invited Gaither Pratt, who worked with uh, Ryan at Duke University, to work with him at the University of Virginia. Uh, I had high regards for Gaither Pratt, not so much for Ryan. Gaither Pratt was a very hard working man. When I say something slightly negative about Ryan, maybe that was my ignorance, or at that time, perhaps he would fit in much better now. Ryan, when I met him, was primarily concerned with public relations matter and money, not really doing research. And uh, this, of course, is now what's happening more and more in universities. So in many ways, maybe he was very far ahead of his time. But at that stage, I saw this as slightly negatively. And, um, and what I think I still see negatively is that he didn't treat Gaither Pratt very well. Gaither Pratt was a very hard-working man under Ryan, who did actually most of the real work. Uh, this was appreciated by Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia, so he offered him a much better job there. And Gaither Pratt eventually went there. And, and when I had uh, by then a job at the University of Tasmania lecturing in psychology, I went on study leave to uh, work with Gaither Pratt. Initially, again, on relatively, um, let's say, in word, comma, normal parapsychological research, ESP, PK, and all that sort of thing. But through Ian Stevenson, I then became aware of the uh, uh, cases of the reincarnation type. And uh, I developed, right from the beginning, a very high regard for Ian Stevenson, who I saw as a very decent and uh, a very remarkable academic in the best sense. And when he later on sort of offered me the opportunity to follow in his footsteps, so to speak, because in the first place, quite literally, to look at some of the cases that he had investigated, in, particularly in Turkey, Thailand, and Burma, I went back to these countries and um, sort of initially just had a second interview with the people involved, but then started off looking at cases of my own. So now we come to the so-called cases of the reincarnation type, and I would like to sort of say something in more general terms about them before we come to the one that uh, I want to present to you. Now what happens is that usually a young child, just shortly after he or she starts to speak, will, if someone takes notice of it or is aware of it, will say something unusual which, uh, the ch which suggests that the child has information which he could not have picked up out of his normal present day environment. In other words, you get the impression the child had paranormal information which is usually in the uh, cultures where a belief in reincarnation exists interpreted as the child is the reincarnation of somebody or rather. If that person is known in the literature that's usually referred to as a solved case, if the person is unknown or is never found, then this remains an unsolved case. Now, as far as I'm concerned with respect to most of my research, I've mainly dealt only with so-called solved cases where a child said something about a person which was later on or immediately identified. So what does a child say? It says usually just a few things. It might uh, be um, in a dramatic way even say something like, you are not my mother. And if, if the child is, is asked, well, who is your mother? Then the child might give a name or say something more. More often, the child might simply be inspired by something if the child then travels through a neighboring village and say, oh, I know this, or point something out, then uh, again, there may be, if there is the cultural setting for it, further questions, and uh, the child might enough, give enough information on the basis of which the person who died 
about whom the child seems to have information can be identified. And very often then contact is established between the family, sometimes the families are known to each other, and then of course a critic has a good reason to say, well maybe the child just heard something, maybe an over interested mother or father or relative might have just interpreted some sounds that the child gave as in agreement with some names that she knew about a person who died or whatever. And I'm not uh, suggesting that this never happens, but it doesn't happen as much as I think critics would suggest. The main reason for this is, I hope you can hear me when I don't talk to the microphone, <laughs> um, the main reason for this is that um, the cultures, at least in which I investigated these cases, are not such that they are over-enthusiastic about it. After all, if a kid says to his mother, you are not my mother, it's not the sort of most uh, endearing thing to hear. And even if the child doesn't say something quite as dramatic as that, there are usually within the family some people who sort of think this is not a particularly good thing to pursue. There are also, for various reasons, which I don't know, quite a number of superstitions. Some, one of them, for instance, is that children who talk about previous lives will die young. I think there is no, as far as I know, no evidence for this, but there is nevertheless associated with this the belief that if the child is then prevented from talking, that then this kind of uh, uh, trouble might not occur. So the, the enthusiasm among the uh, population where this is more or less accepted is by no means as high as uh, critics imagine who say, well, if a child starts to talk, they immediately say, oh, it must be so and so, and therefore, and, and sort of the child is encouraged to, to give names and whatnot on the basis of which then uh, the assumption is made there is a connection which in reality doesn't exist. Now, it can sometimes happen, but I think this is much less likely the case than I think is sometimes suggested by the critics. There is, and I can come up with some photos, a further connection with these cases in general, and that is when a person dies with some particular injury, you may get a child born, apparently with some connection to this person, who has a birthmark or sometimes even a birth defect, which is in some agreement with this in injury. These cases don't occur very often. They occur in some areas more often than others and may have something to do with uh, the purely physiological conditions under which birthmarks occur more often or less often. So typically you see in some areas of Thailand, you see some more of them in some areas of um, Burma, which is now called uh, Myanmar, you see more of it in other areas, you see far less of it. But there's also another connection which I find very interesting, and these are the so-called uh, experimental birthmarks, it's I think a term that Ian Stevenson used, where, uh, where this tradition exists that they believe reincarnation occurs. When a person dies, and I think this is particularly done in, or used to be done in some areas of Thailand, when a person dies and the dead body is somewhere put on, on, on a stretcher or something, the relative will use a bit of charcoal, usually just on the tip of a finger, and make a mark on this person, say a little prayer, when you come back, please bring this mark with you. And then uh, you may occasionally get a child born with this mark, and if this is all in agreement, and uh, often at least it's approximately in agreement, then they say, oh, this must be the uh, person returned. Now there is another alternative explanation for this. Um, I mean an alternative to believing that it is really a reincarnation return of this person. And that is what's uh, called maternal impression, which was a term used in particularly in German medical science at the beginning of the last century, probably until about 1920, and then petered out without ever being sort of uh, rejected as being false. It was simply, uh, it, people lost interest in it. 
the, the idea of this uh, maternal impression was that if a mother sees something uh, while she is pregnant or at certain times of her pregnancy, maybe even before she got pregnant, I'm not quite sure what the exact uh, uh, terminology was that was used at that time, then uh, her child may be born with a birthmark or birth defect which is in agreement with what this uh, mother or this uh, future mother uh, saw at that time. Now, if that is the case, then again you can say, well, maybe this is not uh, reincarnation in the real sense, but simply some impression that was transmitted to the child. I'll just give you, well, um, this is a nice little gadget, um, some examples of these, if I can find them. Uh, now, you see one on the foot that was a, uh, I think it's from Thailand, if I remember correctly, uh, that was made with charcoal on the person who died and the child was born with this. Uh, this is not connected directly, but it is a house in Turkey where we had a particularly strong case and where the child gave quite a number of information about the house, although uh, the child couldn't po could not have possibly have seen it or any pictures of it or anything like this. Uh, this is a case that I don't really uh, expound now and therefore I can't give you the exact details that the child gave, but there were a remarkable number of details about this house that the child gave which were correct to make it at least very unlikely that it was coincidental and the other circumstances were such to say that it's also very unlikely that the child could have heard something in his present life by normal means. Uh, this is now the birthmark on the hand of this child, one on the foot. There is sort of the um, suggestion where people believe it that you shouldn't really put it particularly on a girl somewhere where it later on might look ugly. So to put it under the foot seems to be a, a very sensible way of doing it. Uh, this is just a kind of typical uh, scene that you get when you go to countries like Burma or Thailand and when you look at these cases and they also to some extent represent some um, reassurance against the suggestion by skeptics that people tell you stories because the story that is told by one family is usually known by all the other families and if the person who tells you the story would tell you outright lies, I think this would be uh, out and out rejected and it would be quite obvious. So I think you usually typically work in situations where you have quite a lot of people around you and where therefore in a sense there is some degree of uh, reassurance that what you hear is um, correct, at least to the extent that people know it, at least it is not a conspiracy, unless you, you allow for very elaborate conspiracies that the whole village is trying to, to uh, deceive you, but there is no practical uh, benefit for this, so I can't really imagine that this typically happened. Right, now this is the one case where the uh, hard to see. You see an arm, you see three marks on the arm and where there was a more elaborate uh, experimental birthmark made on the person who died, in other words with three fingers and the same sort of three, three finger mark reappeared on the person who was then associated with it. This is just a reminder that um, all this work is not always fun. You work under rather difficult conditions this is probably a jeep from the last world war which is still happily used in places like Burma and you travel over very rough roads and the thing breaks down and all this sort of thing. There's another birthmark on the neck where I think that people were far less uh, careful as to where they put the, the charcoal mark on the dead person but people sometimes are not all that careful about it. So I think now I have sort of tried to give you a somewhat more general introduction to these uh, reincarnation cases as they are seen. Uh, children talk, people take some notice if 
they are in an environment where uh, this is more or less accepted, but it's usually not accepted to, to the degree that they say, oh, hooray, here we have another case and we must publicize it, but rather uh, they are often interested not to talk, not to uh, publicize it, and sometimes you, uh, I'm quite sure, quite often we never hear about it. But um, this sort of leads to the question, are there reincarnation cases everywhere and we just don't know about it or are they limited to certain uh, cultural areas? I think they do exist everywhere. I think I talked to someone else here before. I don't hope I don't repeat myself. Uh, I think Ian Stevenson asked uh, to a rather large audience in, in a normal Western um, group whether they have any knowledge or memories of such cases. And while, of course, they haven't had cases in the sense that they were investigated, apparently a number of parents said, yes, my child said something at some stage, but we didn't take any notice of it, which makes me believe that probably a very small percentage of children have these information about uh, a previous life or previous person who died, but only in cultural settings where this makes sense is any notice taken and where it doesn't make sense the, uh, they simply say don't talk nonsense or don't take any notice and this happens when the children are very small in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases they are satisfied if they then play with something else and the whole thing is forgotten. So that's a sort of general background. So I'll perhaps now briefly at least outline the case that I specifically listed for today and the reason why I did this, A, it was one that I investigated quite recently uh, in um, 08. I went to Turkey and looked at a few cases and came across this case more or less during my last days and therefore I couldn't finish it and found it very interesting and therefore went briefly back uh, just in April this year and uh, this is sort of the result of these two uh, investigations. Now it's in one way a somewhat unusual case because we got the information about a person who by then was no longer a child but already a, a lady of, uh, in her 40s but her mother was still there who remembered better than she herself what happened and apparently in this case there was fairly good evidence that no contact was established while the child was talking at a young age. And this again for, for various reasons that they uh, were afraid that uh, something might happen and only later was contact established. I think the, f the father found out that what the child said uh, was correct when the child was already four years old. So that's until then no connection was uh, existed between the two families. Even when the child was four years old, the child was not uh, allowed to see the relatives of the person about whom she spoke and uh, only in fact when she was 17 was she allowed to see them. This case was in that respect somewhat unusual that the child maintained an interest even though um, you know she, she was by then older and it's possible at least it's, I think it's even quite likely that in the typical cases where children talk and parents then take some, some interest or, or reject it that that's the end but in this case uh, because the parents didn't reject it but didn't allow the child to see the person or to make contact but at the same time in, indicated that there was something in what she said that this interest was maintained. So when she was 17 she was finally allowed to go and visit the village uh, where the person died about whom this child had, uh, about whom as a child she had given information and it turned out that quite a number of things were correct. I'll try to just briefly come back to them. Yes, in particular she said, and I've seen the situation, she said that she had lived in a house or that it happened in a house with oval windows. Uh, well, not with square windows but with oval windows, which even Turkey, with Turkey, uh, are quite unusual but do happen occasionally. 
Now we found that in fact the uh, house to which we referred and which was in a village more than five kilometers away did have oval willows, windows, but by the time we visited this village much later they had replaced it with square ones because when you have to repair them that's nowadays much cheaper than to put the original oval ones in. She had also said and that I think was one of the uh, particularly impressive points uh, that she was shot. Now when shooting take place and you usually think of murder and what not and uh, therefore uh, we were sort of quite interested in what would happen and how do we resolve this case but there was quite a nice explanation for this because in this house with oval windows when the previous person was shot at a relatively young age of 14 or thereabouts um, the uh, village or not the whole village necessarily, but the people in the house had a big party on account of a neighbor having, uh, getting married. And what the Turks used to do, and to some extent still inclined to do now, they shoot guns on those occasions. I mean, just fire outside shooting guns up, bang, bang, to, to make a noise and, and, you know, to celebrate, not, not for any, any nasty purposes. But it so happened that one of these gunshots went astray and hit this uh, young woman while she was looking out of the window in St. Vesus oval window and she got hit to that extent that she died. Now this could be quite clearly established and I think we had very little reason to doubt that um, the information that the, the child gave later on as a woman uh, could have, that she should have, could have had this information by normal means that she gave this information when there was no knowledge about this shooting that was established and this was, this was confirmed afterward. This was probably the strongest part of it. i just try and look. There were a few more details which she gave which could be confirmed. She mentioned how she had died, that she was shot. I'm coming to the second visit and I might just read out a few um, points about it. We went to the village situated in difficult high hills at the end of the road um, and we heard from several individuals what was in agreement with those who were present and there was no suggestion of, of any false or deliberately exaggerated statement. Now this happened uh, quite a long time ago and you could say uh, you know what we investigated now and heard then did happen and, and what was told happened is more than 30 years ago. Now you could say with some justification well that's rather doubtful if it goes that far back how can you be sure. Now you can't be sure but I have at least one reason why I feel fairly confident about it quite apart from having met the people. Uh, at the end of the war in last world war in Germany uh, we got sort of bombed out twice and last moved to a village which was officially the smallest registered village in Germany. It consisted of two farmhouses and a primary school to which children from I think two neighboring villages went uh, and we lived there for a while in a little uh, hunting lodge when we had uh, been bombed out and were allowed to use it. And in this village I think you had exactly the same atmosphere that you had in this uh, Turkish village at the end of a road where people knew each other for years and where matters were discussed which went 20 years back, 40 years back and so on. And therefore at least to me it made good sense that the uh, villagers in this Turkish village were equally convinced about what happened uh, even after a relatively long time interval. But you can always argue about it. So uh, this case then is one which I think is uh, in many ways um, fairly convincing because the opportunity for the child to say something on account of accidental or uh, information around it was relatively small. I think probably until you ask question I'll leave this case there were still a few further bits of information that the child gave but I think the, uh, the oval window business and the way she died was probably what 
I found most uh, convincing when that was confirmed. Of course, particularly when you hear that, that someone died, you normally don't expect that this was due to accidental shooting. Uh, I will use the last few minutes just to come back a little bit to the question of um, what we mean by reincarnation. Now, I have really no idea what should be meant by it, but I think we should assume that it means more than what, is, uh, which, what can be accounted for by uh, genetic uh, dispositions and by the environmental factors to which, uh, say, two people are subjected in a similar way. If you then get similarities and they're due to environmental factors or genetic factors, you would not normally say that this is a reincarnation. You may, of course, say in a loose sort of way, well, the boy is a reincarnation of his father, but of course that's just a kind of nice saying, but it doesn't really mean anything. If you want to say something more about reincarnation, I think one should assume that something in addition to these things is there, some uh, connection, some continuation from one person to another, and all I can say is these case studies to my mind, do not uh, suggest that this is particularly happening. If for other reasons you believe that it is happening, these case studies do not necessarily deny it. But I think these case studies are more readily uh, appreciated and understood if you simply see them as cases of involving uh, whatever you like to call it, extrasensory perception, size, the normal sort of things that you get uh, between normal living persons, sometimes over time intervals and all this sort of thing, but not as a continuation of some substance of some soul from some dying person to some young child. When I started with this research quite some time ago, and I have uh, really been at it for quite a number of years, uh, I was more open to the suggestion that perhaps there is something in this business of reincarnation, but in practical terms, I have more come to the conclusion that this is less likely because very often you have quite clear-cut connections between the child, when you see her as a child or sometimes older, and the previous person as far as we can judge from the relatives, relatives that we talk to, but uh, very little sort of emotional or other suggestion that this is really a continuation. <coughs> now, of course, you can get emotions into it because quite often the families are related. And sometimes, particularly if a child dies and is then uh, a, 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 another child is regarded as a rebirth case, well, that child may even be taken up by the family and uh, looked after and all this sort of thing. But these are all normal situations which, to my mind, do not suggest that that child, therefore, is the, uh, the reincarnation of the previous person because you had already genetic connections and so on. So my uh, summary of this is we have uh, in this field quite good evidence that some children uh, have at certain time of their life, shortly after they start to speak, paranormal information about someone who had died before they lived, but that this paranormal information is not necessarily a sign of a continuation of this person in terms of whatever you might call reincarnation. I think with that I'd like to finish. Thanks.